Welcome to the show, everybody. Thanks for joining. We have a lot of news to get to. The first thing is the jobless claim. We have the data out and we did it. We broke yet another record. This has been the month of breaking records. The jobless claim was no different. Record 3.28 million people filed for unemployment. 3.28 million. That's a really big number, but we're going to go ahead and later on put this into context, compare it to previous recessions and previous events like this, see how it stacks up. We also have the $2 trillion stimulus package that I'm sure you've heard a little bit about, but now we have more of the details about it. So we're going to dive into this, see what's actually inside of it, see who benefits and what I think of it overall. And then of course we have my portfolio. I've regained a lot of the losses over the past week. So if you remember my previous episode called Dividend Cuts, my response, this one I was in the red by 13500 bucks. And then in between this episode and where I'm at right now, my portfolio actually went down to negative $16,000, quite a bit in the red there. But here we are sitting with it, negative 6,700 bucks. Not only has the market been highly volatile, but during this time I've been doing a lot of buying. So I'm gonna go through some of the companies that I've been buying. In my telecom pie here, I have purchased a lot of AT&T. This is a company that does have some risk with it. They have a high debt load. They've been doing a lot of acquisitions through their history. They have a problem with sports being shut down. With DirecTV, a big selling point of it was sports that's closed right now. So I'm sure a lot of people are canceling their DirecTV. So these are concerns with AT&T. They do have a, a lot of risk with them, a lot of downside. They do have some upside though. I think that their HBO Max product is a really solid product. I think that they are trying to aggressively pay down their debt. They pay a really high yield right now. And they're a company that has a very long standing dividend policy. So I've grown my stake in this company. I now own a total value of about 4,300 bucks. This is one that I will make a bigger holding in my portfolio, but it does have some risk with it. In consumer, we have Disney. This is another company that I've about doubled or even tripled my stake in. So I have about $3,000 in this company. This one is one that had its price come down so much that it used to be selling at 150. It came down to about 110, 100. And I got really excited and even bought it there. And then it continued to fall down to 90 and even into the 80s. So I bought it a little bit early. It still might fall further, but I think that any of those price points are good with Disney. I think that given a 10 year timeline with this company, it'll be well back on its feet. So I don't expect these issues we're facing right now to last forever. I expect a lot of people wanting to go to amusement parks when this is all over. They want to get out and do something active, get a breath of fresh air. In the meantime, this has been very harsh on this company. The downward price pressure is because the company has shut down almost all of it, pretty much everything except for their streaming service. I could definitely see Disney suspending their dividend until this is clearly over because it's not good for them to pay out shareholders when they don't have any revenue. So if they do that, if they suspend their dividend, I'm not selling this company. I've already made up my decision on that. That's not something I'm gonna be doing. I think that this is unfortunate that they have to have their parks closed, but I think it will be temporary. In the long run, I think it's a good buy. In healthcare, we have a lot of different companies. I've been buying mostly Merck. That's the top one that I've been buying. I now have a stake of about $3,000 in it. I think that it's a safe bet. There really isn't the most upside potential with it because I don't think its price has fallen all that much. So this isn't a company that has came down a ton of value that you can really take advantage of right now. I think it's just a decent company with a good outlook that is insulated from the current concerns. So that's one that I've increased my stake in, but the price is still pretty high for Merck. And then we have finance. In my finance pie, I've been buying a lot of the normal banks that have gone down in value, companies like JP Morgan, Bank of America, insurance company Aflac. I bought some T. Rowe price. I put a little bit of money into each of these because the whole financial sector has came down a lot. This is one of the sectors that dropped the most. Anytime the economy looks like it's going to go into recession, banks go down in value. They go down in value because a lot of the companies that they lend to might go out of business in a recession. And so if they're lending to a lot of companies that are going out of business, they're going to lose some money. On top of that, banks make money with loans. When the Fed lowers the interest rate, that's something that makes it so they don't make quite as much money with loans. So those two events happening at the same time, the interest rates coming down, companies may be going out of business, make it so banks go down in value. Now, I put a little bit of money into these because I think that the recession or the economy going into a downturn might not be quite as bad as people are assuming. The biggest company, though, that I've increased my stake in is Main Street Capital. This isn't a traditional bank. It works similar to a bank where it gives loans to companies, but Main Street gives loans to companies that can't get loans from normal banks. Main is a business development company. Any business development company has a substantial amount of risk more than your average company. Has far more risk than JP Morgan and Bank of America. 
it can have a lot of the people it's lending out to go bankrupt, which can drag down Maine. So this is a company that I would not invest in unless you're willing to take on a substantial amount of risk. That has to be said with any company that's a business development company. The reason that I purchased this one is because last week it was getting to such a low price point that I thought that the potential reward of it outweighed the risk. So it went down quite a bit in price. I scooped up some of the shares. Now I have a pretty good stake of this company. And then we have real estate. These are all my different REITs. Real estate has been one of the hardest hit sectors over the past couple weeks. It's been hit so hard that it's brought us almost back to 2008, 2009 levels. Think about how bad that is, that real estate companies are being priced back to where they were in 2008. So this whole sector has came down substantially. I've been buying a number of these companies. I'm gonna go through which ones I've been buying, but there's a couple of reasons why they've gone down in value. I think it's important to understand that. One of them is we obviously have the health threat. We can go outside and walk around by ourselves, but a lot of these companies are completely closed. A lot of businesses and restaurants have just shut their doors. And a lot of them are actually calling up their landlord and saying, hey, we're not paying rent this month. So uh, sorry, but we're not paying this month. The landlord in that situation, think about this for a minute. What are they going to do about that? They can't exactly kick them out. Who are they going to replace them with? That would just be more expensive, more time consuming. They have to just live with it until this goes through. So a lot of this issue has been passed on to the landlord. If they can't afford rent, they're just not gonna pay it. That's what some of them are doing. They know that they're not gonna get evicted in that case. We have other companies like LTC Properties and Well Tower that are healthcare REITs. I don't even wanna go into the horrific story out of Washington state, but these healthcare companies that take care of senior people are at a lot of risk with this virus. If it gets into the facilities, and it starts getting passed around, it can cause a lot of problems. So investors are concerned that these companies are going to face issues. So there's risk with the healthcare REITs. There's risk with the commercial retail REITs. There's also risk with companies like Simon Property that are completely shut down. They're simply relying on their balance sheet. They're just saying, do we have enough cash to get through this until whenever we open back up? If we don't, then we're going to have to start taking out debt from other places. And then we have NRZ. This one is a mortgage REIT. So all these other companies are equity REITs. They just invest in real estate properties, they own the buildings, and they rent them out to tenants. That's what they do. NRZ does not do that. It invests in mortgages. Really, it invests in residential mortgages. This company has gone down a lot in value because the drop in interest rates has made them less profitable. And if we enter into a recession and people stop paying their mortgages, that could be a problem for NRZ. So this company has gone down substantially. Mortgage rates in general are higher leveraged companies. They pay a higher dividend, but they are of course higher risk. So this company has gone down quite a bit as well. Over the past week, I have not invested in Simon Property or NRZ. I've not purchased any more shares of those two companies. I just think the risk right now is still too great for them to be adding into them. The companies that I've been adding more to are Realty Income Corp, Store Capital, and mostly LTC Properties and Well Tower. These two companies that are the healthcare ones, maybe they'll face tremendous issues with the virus. I, I don't know. I'm not a health expert, but I just feel like they will have procedures to be able to protect their patients. So hopefully that's the case. Hopefully this virus doesn't go and really affect these two companies that lease out to the senior living communities. But my bet is that they'll do okay through this. I think that they'll continue to have their tenants pay rent. I think they'll continue to have business and hopefully they can implement procedures to make it so the threat of the virus isn't too great. So that's the bet I'm making. There's a risk with this, but I'm hoping that these two companies do okay. So that's what I've been doing over the past week. I've been doing the same thing that I always do. I've been buying shares in companies that I want to own. So this is nothing new. There's nothing exciting about this. There's no advanced strategy here. There's no guru investment advice here. I buy these companies if the market goes up and I buy them if the market goes down. If the market goes down a lot, like it has over the past month, if it goes down 30%, that's going to be a time where I try to buy a little bit more. I look at my personal situation, I say, Am I going to get fired? Am I going to lose my income? Is this all going to come to an end and I'm going to have a difficult time providing for my family? Or do I have a continual income stream? Can I still afford to purchase shares during this? If it's the second option and I have money to continue investing during this downturn, I'm going to use that money as an opportunity to buy these shares at a reduced price. There are a lot of companies that are at a good price right now that will survive this downturn. So that's what I'm trying to take advantage of. Everybody's situation is different. I realize that there's some people that they're not YouTubers. They don't work in an industry that was unaffected by this. You might have lost your job or had your hours reduced. You might not have enough savings. In that situation, you have different priorities. You probably can't take advantage of the downturn quite as much. So I realize everybody's in different situations. But if you're in the situation where you can't invest right now, now's a pretty decent time to do it. 
This portfolio is down right now a little bit, but I think I have a collection of really good companies. I'm going to get it back into green. I'm going to get this portfolio to the point where I'm earning hundreds, if not thousands of dollars a month in dividends. The past couple months, I've been earning 200 to $300 in dividends. I want this progression to keep going. I want to get to the point where I'm earning thousands of dollars. So that's the goal with it. And that's the direction I'm going to keep going with it. Now, I want to get to some news here. I want to contrast two different items of news here. One of them is the record 3.28 million file for unemployment. 3.28 million. You might not know how many people normally file for employment, but I'm going to show that in a minute. This is a lot more. It's a dramatic amount more. So we have this news that is really breaking news right now. It just came out today. 3.28 million people file for unemployment. Let's go ahead and take a look at how the market is currently reacting to this news. We're up 5.6% in the Dow Jones. So we have 3.28 million people out of work and the Dow Jones is up 5.6%. You'll have a lot of people that contrast these two different news items and they can't make heads or tails of it. They say, why do we have 3.28 million people file for unemployment, a huge spike in it, but yet the stock market is going up and it's going up a lot. Why does that make any sense? Are investors just dumb? Why don't they have the stock market go down with this news? That's what a lot of people are gonna take from this. The thing you have to realize is that investors invest based off of expectations. They were already expecting a huge spike in unemployment. We've been told about how bad this quarantine has been for jobs. Lots of people are staying home. You can't really keep a lot of jobs if they close down the stores. So investors already expected bad unemployment. This is something that has been heavily priced in. In fact, we've heard stories of 30% unemployment. That sounds horrific. So investors are pretty nervous about this. Coming out with a number of 3.28 million, that's a lot, but that's probably in line with what most people's expectations were. If this number came out and it was 10 million, I think you would see a different result in the stock market. That would be way above what people are expecting. It'd be far scarier and the stock market would probably go down. 3.28 million is a lot, but that's in line with what most people were expecting. Now, I wanna give a couple visuals of just how big this number is, especially in comparison to history. We have this chart right here, where if you look at this bar at the very right, that is the March jobless claims, the 3.2 million. Compare that to any year beforehand. They're not even close. We have 0.2 million. Even in the 2008 and 2009 financial crisis, when people were getting laid off like crazy, no initial jobless claim went past, what is it, 0.9 million? Not even close. So this is a lot of initial jobless claims. Don't get this confused with unemployment rate. So this is not the unemployment rate. This is people filing for unemployment, which is different. We don't know how many people are currently unemployed. That data will come in a little bit later. Here's another visual of the initial jobless claims, but this one's on a bigger timeline, all the way back to 1970. And you can see these pink bars coming down. These are recessions. So even during recessions, you can see a spike in the initial jobless claims, but it's nothing like right here. 3.2 million is like three times what any of the other ones have been. So this jobless claim number is a very big number. It's largely being ignored by investors. The market's even going up as a reaction to it. But I think part of the reason why is the stimulus bill that's being passed through Congress. We have a lot of details on this bill. It's supposed to help those very people that are being laid off right now. It has a lot of unemployment benefits. So let's go ahead and dive into some of the specifics on the bill. Just some technical parts on it. It gives a one-time direct payment to up to $1,200 for individuals, $2,400 for couples, with $500 added for every child. Based on your 2019 tax returns for those who filed them and 2018 information if they have not. The benefit would start to phase out above 75,000 in income for individuals and 150,000 for couples, going away completely at 99,000 and 198,000 thresholds respectively. So this actually seems like a pretty solid number. $1,200 for individuals, $2,400 for couples, and then 500 bucks for every child. That's a good amount of cash that the government is handing out to people during this downturn. So hopefully that will be helpful. I think that that's a pretty decent amount. If people had zero savings, they could still be in for a really rough time, but this certainly won't hurt. So getting this amount of cash will definitely help people pay rent and survive the next couple of weeks. It is funny how it's based off your most recent taxes. So people who haven't filed taxes this year might benefit for doing that. They might benefit for being very late to filing taxes because then it would be based off your 2018 income. And if your 2018 income was less, you benefit because of that. So it's dependent on the year that you filed taxes. I'm pretty sure that you also have to have earned an income. So if you earned no income in 2018, you're probably not going to see any of this money. But if you've earned income 
and it's less than 75,000 for individuals, you're going to get 1200 bucks. If you're married and you earned less than 150,000, you're going to get $2400 plus 500 bucks for every child that you have. Another thing this bill does is really boost up unemployment insurance. A lot of people after this bill that have been on unemployment and have this insurance they might not want to go back to work after this. It boosts the unemployment insurance, adding 600 bucks per week for up to four months on top of what the beneficiary normally receives from the states. That's a lot of money because normally you do get unemployment insurance. From the states, it's usually not too good. It's just enough to really buy groceries. It's not a lot of money, but adding 600 bucks a week on top of that, that's quite a bit of money. It also outlines that it has $500 billion set aside for a pool of loans to different investments, businesses, and states. It also gives $25 billion in grants to airlines and cargo carriers just to pay employee wages, their salaries, their benefits, that type of thing. So there's a lot of money set aside in an attempt to keep people employed during this thing. The whole purpose of this bill is a temporary solution for this virus. That's really the whole point, is just to get people by, have them in good spirits, have us come out strong when this whole thing is done. So that's the purpose of it. Hopefully it accomplishes that. I do think that it's a lot of money. This $2 trillion is the biggest stimulus package ever in the history of the US. It's the biggest one. So it's a lot of money being given out. Now, another part of this that I thought would be worth mentioning is the tireless efforts that Congress put into crafting this bill. I'll go ahead and read a quote from Senator Schumer. He says, After five days of arduous negotiations, after sleep-deprived nights and marathon negotiation sessions, we have a bipartisan agreement on the largest rescue package in American history. Now, I really just want to stop here and take a moment to thank Senator Schumer and really the, the rest of Congress for their tireless work. They worked five whole days on negotiating this package. Five days. And you have to understand, guys, I know that's like a normal work week for the rest of us, but that's a big deal for Congress. This is way different than their normal two-day work week. This cut into a lot of time at their vacation homes. Think about how many rounds of golf they missed. This is five days. And not only five days, but these days they had to work past their normal work hours, into the p.m., into the evening. Can you imagine that? Them actually having to work past what they normally do. So... I know this was a huge sacrifice. I, I know that this took a lot uh, to be able to negotiate a package to give Americans some of their own money. This is something where they really had to work a lot for this. So I just want to thank Senator Schumer. I want to thank the rest of Congress for your tireless work in giving back Americans some of their taxpayer money. Now, moving on, I want to mention one more part of this bill that I think is pretty important, especially for dividend investors. This outlines two different requirements for companies that receive any type of government welfare. So the first thing is, is it says the legislation would also bar certain companies from paying dividends to shareholders for one year after the loan is paid back. So not only can these companies not pay dividends while they have a loan from the government, but they also can't pay dividends for an entire year after paying back that loan. That is a really big thing for companies to consider that are normally known as the dividend payer companies. So a lot of these companies receiving bailouts, if this part of the bill still stands, if this is still part of the final, final version that gets passed, these companies are not going to be paying dividends for a very long time. The other thing that it mentions is that if they do receive this government aid, they can't lay off more than 10% of their workforce. So they have to keep 90% of their employees until September. So it has those two different requirements, but I think especially the dividend one is going to be something of interest to people investing in these companies on the basis they're going to be bailed out by the government. Realize that you might not get dividends for years with those companies. So overall, I think that this is a decent bill. Uh, $2 trillion is a lot of money. It's certainly going to help during this downturn when people are staying at home. It's going to help with unemployed people. It's going to help some businesses stay solvent and get a lifeline that were doing okay before the crisis. So businesses that didn't have enough cash on hand. These aren't typically the ones that you want to own, but some of these were hit pretty hard. So this bill overall, I think is going to be helpful. A lot of people are concerned about inflation with the Fed printing money, with the government giving money to everybody. Is it going to run inflation super high? The answer is we don't know. That's the answer. Some people will say that they know definitively what it will do with inflation, but inflation is a pretty mysterious thing. It's very difficult to figure out what really affects it. The government has been printing money for quite a while, and they've had a hard time getting inflation to 2%. That's an interesting thing to have happen. 
You think that when the government prints a lot of money, that we would have a ton of inflation, but that's not what we've been seeing. So the simple answer is that we don't know how this is going to affect inflation. You know that the Fed is going to be keeping track of that. So we'll continue to see what inflation moves to, but right now it's difficult to say. Okay, let's get to some questions here. My email address is joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. That's joseph at josephcarlsonshow.com. It's also in the description of the video, as well as my Twitter or Instagram. You can ask the questions there. The first one is from Christian. He says, hi, Joseph. Love the show. Do you think Warren Buffett will invest all of his cash on hand in the market right now? This is a pretty good question. He had, I think, about $128 billion in cash before this downturn. Uh, I think that he is going to invest a lot of it. That would be my assumption. He's going to be buying a lot of a lot of companies. So the reason I make this assumption is that for the past 10 years, Warren Buffett has been heavily criticized for not investing his cash on hand. And he's given reasonings why. He says that he has a million shareholders. He wants to be safe and cautious with it. He owns insurance companies that have a, a large amount that they could have to pay out in big events. But regardless, he's holding a lot of cash. And he has been underperforming the market for the past 10 years. So some investors are pretty frustrated with what he's been doing, having that cash on the side. Now, he's been waiting for a downturn. We have the downturn here. If he doesn't do a lot of investing now, he's going to be heavily criticized because of that. So I think there's a lot of pressure on him to invest. There's a lot of pressure for him to pick up good deals during this downturn. A lot of people are going to be very interested in the deals that he made. So I do think he has a ton of pressure right now to invest. I think that he will spend a lot of his money. I don't know what he's going to be buying, but he might be doing the typical thing where he's on the phone with distressed companies negotiating these deals where he takes like 10 or 20% of the company, he gets some type of preferred stock, he gets a preferred dividend of a high yield, like 10% or something like that. So we'll see what happens. Time will tell. I think he'll be heavily criticized if he doesn't spend a good chunk of money during this downturn. Don says, hey, Joe, how are things going? I love your YouTube videos and thought of reaching out here too. This is an Instagram question. He says, I have a question. If you don't mind, I'm 34 and starting to invest with about $15,000. Would it not make sense to invest in growth stocks like Tesla and collect some capital gains over the next several years? After that, I can sell those shares and invest that in value dividend stocks to start building a passive income. What would you do if you were me? Well, Don, I think that investing in Tesla and hoping that it will grow over the next 10 years, if you've researched the company, and you like the company, you like the leadership, you like the products they sell, you think that it's a relevant growing industry and it's gonna have a lot of capital growth over the next 10 years, there's nothing wrong with that strategy. I never talk against that. I would never say to not do that. There's lots of ways to invest, lots of valid, well-proven ways to grow wealth over long periods of time. So growth investing is definitely in that category of a very well-proven, good way to grow wealth over a long period of time. So. I've never said anything against that. Some people, they look at my content, they look at the fact that I talk about dividends. I like this type of investing strategy. I just personally like it. And since I talk about it and the reasons that I like it, they think that by implication, I'm saying that other types of investing aren't valid. So that's not true. That's not what I've said. That's not what I've ever said. Even since the beginning of the series, I talk about how there's a lot of different ways to invest and the way that I'm choosing to do it is just one of them. So you have a completely valid strategy in focusing on growth companies. I wouldn't tell you otherwise on that. Okay, we have Steven saying on Instagram, hey Joseph, big fan of the YouTube show, been following you for a while. You're great. I appreciate you saying that, Steven. He says, question, do you think the trillion dollar stimulus package is going to bump the market back up and keep it stable, or will it just band-aid and the market will continue to go lower after the presumed small increase from the package? This is an interesting question. I obviously have said many times that I don't know what direction the market's going in the short term. I don't concern myself too much with short-term fluctuations. I will take advantage of it. When the market comes down like it did over the past couple of weeks, I'll do some buys. It might fall further. That's the risk you take with the market going down is You have to decide is now a good time to buy with the prices of these companies, knowing that there's a good chance it could continue to fall. So I don't know what direction the market's going. With the stimulus package, the question is, is it a Band-Aid? Depends on your definition of a Band-Aid. Is it temporary? This certainly is a temporary solution. This is a solution that's supposed to help with people that have had their financial situation completely shocked over the past couple weeks. Everything has changed financially for a lot of people. They've been laid off. This is supposed to just be a temporary thing to get us through this time. Now, on a broader picture, if I zoom out a little bit and we look at this on a broader picture, we have the threat of a virus. That's what we're facing. 
is a virus that's spreading everywhere. The people that we have involved in this, combating this, uh, if you look at everything, we have the Fed, which is shooting with both barrels. They've lowered interest rates. They're implementing quantitative easing. They're offering liquidity in every way possible to stimulate the economy. We have the government now offering this $2 trillion stimulus package, helping out key industries, keeping businesses in business for the time being, putting money into people's pockets for the time being. And then we have the healthcare industry that's pretty good. We have a lot of healthcare officials that are very smart. They're going to come up with solutions to the threat at hand. They're going to figure out this virus, how to treat it, how to quarantine from it, all the proper ways to do it. I know some of them are on the phone with Europe and they're on the phone with China asking about the best ways to combat it. So I just look at the overall picture. Everybody is stacking up against this threat. I think that we're going to win. I think that we're going to come out on top. I'm naturally a pretty optimistic person, but I just think rationally that there's too many smart people in too many different industries working against one issue here. So if I'm going to put myself on a side, I'm going to be on our side, not the side of thinking the virus is going to destroy the global economy, enter us into a prolonged deep recession, and that it will go uncontrollable everywhere. So there's two different sides that you can be on. I'm definitely on the more optimistic side overall. And I'm investing with that thought. I'm investing with that thesis. So the reason that I'm buying the market right now is that I think it'll eventually recover. The next question is from Eric. He says, hi, Joseph. First, I wanted to say how much I appreciate and enjoy your show. Uh, thanks for saying that, Eric. He says, I wanted to see what your current thoughts are on how badly the REIT sector is being beaten up. There is chatter online that many of the companies will need to announce dividend suspensions, and some may even not make it through to the other side of this crisis. Which REITs do you see as safe? Which, if any, do you plan to dump? And which, if any, are you on the fence about? Lastly, I wanted to see if you have plans to purchase shares of stocks that do not currently pay dividends, but could likely in the future. Thanks so much. I'll continue to enjoy your show, and I'm currently enjoying picking up shares at a reduced cost for the moment. All right, Eric. Well, I appreciate the email. You mentioned REITs. I already talked about REITs a little bit at the beginning of this episode. I talked about the different threats they're facing, the reason that the price has gone down so much on them. Now, as far as chatter online of these companies announcing dividend suspensions and dividend cuts, I definitely think there's a chance that some of them could cut their dividend. They're in a situation right now where like Simon Property has everything closed. There's nobody visiting their stores and they own Forever 21. So some of their tenants are companies they own. Obviously, they're not really paying rent because they have no revenue. And even tenants that they don't own, other companies are saying, we're not going to pay rent this month. We don't have the money to do it. So that falls on the REIT. Some of them might cut their dividend. But as far as them doing that in that situation, I'm not going to be selling because of that. I think it's unrealistic to expect companies to continue paying dividends when they've had everything closed because of the virus going on. So I'm not going to sell based off of that reason alone. Now, as far as my REITs, which one will make it to the other side, which ones won't? I think most of them will. I definitely think that the healthcare ones will. I think that Realty Income Corp will. I even think Simon Property will because it has a pretty strong balance sheet. It can get money from other sources unless this goes on for a very long time. So that is the biggest variable here is how long this shutdown lasts. If it lasts three plus months, then yeah, this could cause a lot of stress for REITs. But I think we'll be going back out to businesses a little bit before that. So it all depends on the timeline there. The one that I'm most concerned about is probably NRZ, the mortgage REIT. That one's the highest risk. It has the most leverage. It has the highest chance, I think, of going out of business. That's the one that I'd be the most concerned about. Now, that does depend on the amount of people that don't pay their mortgages. That's what they're investing in is residential mortgages. If a lot of people don't pay that, then it will hurt companies like NRZ. So we'll see with that. That one's probably the highest risk. Hopefully, all of them will make it through. I think the stimulus package definitely helps the chances of all of these REITs making it through to the end of the crisis. Now, your next question you ask, do I plan on purchasing companies that don't currently pay dividends but might in the future? I've looked at that and I think it's very difficult to do. How do you know if a company is going to pay a dividend? There's a lot of companies that could easily pay dividends, but they choose not to. Look at Google. That company has a great balance sheet, has a steady source of income. It's highly diversified. It's pretty mature. It's a big company. They haven't paid a dividend. And I don't know of any plans to pay one in the future. So there's some companies that just make a lot of money. They're well-established. They're pretty big. And they never pay dividends to shareholders. So unless they go out and say, hey, we're planning on paying a dividend in the future, but then it is a dividend company. If they do say we're planning on paying a dividend in the future. So 
it's kind of a catch-22. I don't know what companies are going to pay dividends because if they never plan to in the future, then they're not a dividend company and we have no clue of if they're ever going to really be a dividend company. So that's not something that I've really done. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and leave it there. Also, if you guys want to support the channel, there is a link to the Discord in the description of the video. You can try that out for a month. I think it's pretty fun. I've received a lot of good feedback about it. So we have daily discussions there on investing. So if you're interested in that type of thing, you can check it out. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys next time.